Slayers, and welcome to another episode of She Slays the Day podcast. I am your host, Dr. Lauren Brunswick, and... I am your temporary co-host, not Dr. Kirby Brunswick. You're going to keep that up, huh? I'm a, I'm a not doctor. You're a not doctor. Um, today's episode, I don't know what it's going to end up being titled, because I don't do that, but... I, feel like I don't either now, which is cool. No. Jacob, do a good job. Yep. I feel like it should be Kirby teaches Lauren how to be mindful. <laughs> sure. Well, this is our thing. We'll see. We'll see if I teach you anything. Maybe you'll teach me something. Probably. I'm being present and patient so that you can teach me something. That is definitely in my strengths and your weaknesses for sure. Um, this is our Thanksgiving episode. So this is what we'll release. People will, I mean, it's Thanksgiving in the past, like Thanksgiving weekend episode. Mm -hmm. So people so have. So hopefully you were thankful. And them, this, not me. Well, I'm you as well. I hope you were thankful because well, I'm going to be doing the cooking. So I hope you were thankful that I cooked and you were good and you appreciated it. I, past Lauren is very curious how future Thanksgiving is going to play out because there are like, there are some rules that Kirby has laid down about this year that have me nervous, but excited. So we'll see. He's cooking everything, mm -hmm. but he's keeping it very basic. Oh, did I clarify? You're not doing stovetop stuffing, right? You're doing like real stuffing. Yeah, I can do whatever. No, 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 no. I'm can't. saying if you tell me your preference now. Okay, can... my preference is not stovetop. Okay. You can do it with sausage and the, and the is it giblets? Yeah. Yeah. Giblets. That, that's a soft G. That has to be in there. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. Okay, I almost just had a panic attack. I'm like, I'm taking it back. You know we're in the past from Thanksgiving. Like, it hasn't happened yet for us, so we can still modify anything. I know, anything. but they're listening in the future, and I'm just curious if I'm happy with the rules that we set. So we'll see. We'll, we'll check in. Um, but Christmas is in full-blown, full-blown, what's it called? Full-blown. Full-bloom? Full-bloom? No, full-blown We're something. in full-blown Christmas mode? Full-blown Christmas mode. That's what I'm trying to say. Except we don't have our tree. Except, oh my God, future past. This is like inception. There's so on many. On the day like... this comes out, we'll be getting our tree. So while you're listening to this, if you're listening to it on Sunday afternoon, know that we are out with our family sledding and getting a tree. And mm -hmm. I think it's going to be cold, but that's okay. We'll yeah. bundle up. Freaking freezing. So, but we started listening, to, or we started watching Christmas movies and listening this week. And I have a question for everyone. So, new Santa Claus. I did not know that it wasn't a movie. So, in my defense, I would just like to say that I thought it was a movie. Okay, you series. thought it was going to be like the fourth Santa yes. Claus. Yes. So, yesterday it came out and we were going to, I said like, Kirby said like, we should watch the new Santa Claus movie. And I said like, oh, we can't because we haven't watched one, two, or three this year we've watched one two and three every, every year, year but for like the last 20 years of our lives um but we hadn't watched it this year and so i had had an issue and i was like no no we can watch santa claus one tonight but we can't watch the new one until we get through the previous three like this has to be in order and so kirby being a kind man let me just like just be like all right whatever so i went to work and spent a lot of the day having the worst table talk ever, like not educating people on jack shit, except polling them and going, okay, so question, um, because we had decorated for Christmas. So like people mm -hmm. were like, oh, it looks so cute in here. It's so Christmassy. And then they would talk about like, they're either for or against. And I'm like, yep, we're watching movies now that you brought it up, Cynthia. What do you think? And I took a poll and I just did poorly. So I came how, home. How poorly? So there was not a single person that I asked, and I probably asked close to 20 people that thought that I needed to watch one, two, or three, as long as I remembered the movies. And I was like, yeah, I remember the movies. They're just... And the funny thing is, I think the original might have come out almost 30 years ago now. Like, I think it was the early 90s. I want to say like 93. Gosh. That crazy. That's really crazy. So, so anyways, we did watch it. It's not a movie. It's a TV series mm -hmm. or I think it's whatever. Like a limited series. I don't know how many there are. It might be like six or eight or something, but they've only released two so far. How did you feel about that? I don't mind it. I mean, I think it's going along with what people are doing right now. And it's not like Tim Allen is just a movie star. He's been part of two super long-running series, so he knows how to be part of a series mm -hmm. 
and it's it stretches it out a little bit more. You yeah. know, if it is like six or eight, I would rather have more content in a slightly different format. It makes it a little bit weird, like next year when it's like, oh, let's watch the Christmas Chronicles. Next year, just... will you watch one, two, oh, three, for sure. and then? Yeah, yeah, okay. I think I do it in order. Next year, you would do it in Yeah, because we don't ever like jump into Home Alone 2 right away. See, that was what I told you. That was a part of my argument is no maniac would watch Home Alone 2 before Home Alone 1. And you said, well, if there was a new Home Alone. But I don't think we did do that because wasn't it last year there was a new Home Alone? Yeah, I think it was last year. But I think the release date was far enough on. And we watch Home Alone usually one of the first ones anyway that it wasn't like, uh, oh, no, it's November 3rd and there's a new Home Alone out. And honestly, since it had all new characters, it didn't feel like, yeah, that uh, was that one I would have probably been okay with. Agreed. So you're not a <coughs> psychopath. Oh my gosh. So anyways, highlight. We today are highlighting Dr. Monica Rader. Um, it's got to be Rader, not Rada, right? Rada. Rada. Monica Rada. Rader. Yeah, I think it's Rader. Anyways, she just signed up at the top level, top tier of the Patreon membership, which is now renamed Road to Success because it's laid out for people who are, well, honestly, we designed it that way because I knew there was going to be people I was talking to about the program. Mm -hmm. And I knew that they wouldn't be at a point necessarily yet to pull the trigger on the program, or they weren't necessarily at that point in their career. The program is the multi-passionate chiropractor. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And so I wanted to have something that I was like, okay, yes, you can still work with me though. And so this way it'll be, she'll get access to an hour live call with me every month, mm -hmm. talking through like practice growth things and also a marketing like training every month. So plus there's just cool stuff of the people at the higher levels get episodes early um, and they get the bonus content for mm -hmm. when you have guests, which those are some of my favorite segments to like. Oh edit my and God, they to. get so uncomfortable, the guests, because they're like prepared for more just like real questions. And then I'm like, oh no. And it's funny too when people, when you say like, what's the hardest time you laugh? And they're like, oh, I don't know. I don't have any good stories. And then Christy st told that story of the kid hitting her. A car with his bike. Oh my god! <laughs> and when he's like, "Fuck your luck," I'm just like left. <laughs> was I was so like, "Sorry about your shitty car or something." Oh my god! I was like, "Wow, that that is truly a hardest time you've laughed worthy story." Oh, I love those things, but I just my brain is so focused on the future that I just forget them. And I remember, like, while I'm laughing, I'm thinking like. Oh my God, it feels so good. Like laughing so good feels like you're scratching an itch. Mm -hmm. It just like, like a really itchy itch that you're just like, oh yeah. Like if I was a dog, my leg would shake. And then I just like, you know, you could ask me at the end of the day, do you laugh about anything today? I'd be like, oh, shit, did I? I don't know. I got a lot accomplished. We'll talk about that in this episode. Oh, look at what we did there. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, anyways, thank you, Monica, for supporting the membership and she slays. It's because of people like her that this podcast keeps going. We'll send you a tote bag. No, no we don't have a tote bag. Send you don't just do it like an NPR bit. I know, but now she's expecting a Monica, tote bag. Monica, I'm sorry. I'm all out of tote bags. <laughs> you never had any tote bags. I mean, I can send you one of the 20... Aldi bags that we have in our house. Yeah, that's how we <laughs> haul things. We go anywhere with the girls just throw their clothes in an Aldi's bag. Monica, shoot me your address. And the next time I'm at the post office, I will totally send you an Aldi bag from She Slays the Day. I'll put, I'll like sign it with a marker. I really hope she sends us her address and you do that. I will have to. I, I, <clears throat> she can't call, I can't call my bluff. I will not be bluffed. No. <laughs> Anyway. Bluff me once, shame on you. <laughs> oh, are you are you ready to be serious today, though? Oh, sure. I can okay. be serious. I'm... I mean, assuming that the point is to be serious. I think we'll talk about that, too. Oh, God, you've got so much in your little notebook over there. I like these episodes where I told Kirby, like, a month ago, hey, we should do an episode because our our other episode, what was the one? Oh, the Would You Rather. 
mm-hmm. went really well. And I said, look, we should just do, like, I got a lot of feedback from that one. People liked it. I think people like this, like, lightness that, like, you throw something fun in there. And so a month ago, I'm like, hey, around Thanksgiving, we should do just, like, a lighthearted, like, mindfulness, gratitude thing. And he's like, mm-hmm, challenge accepted. And so then I'm like, so remember, we're just, like, doing this, like, fun. And he's like, oh, well, I don't know if that's going to be fun. Like, I don't know what. Well, you know, it'll be fun. But you said like lighthearted and getting to these issues sometimes is like, what's the purpose of life? And like <laughs> connecting with a lot today. connecting with God, like definitely fun, not always lighthearted. True. Okay. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> should we pray and get into it? Or I mean, you haven't told anyone about the course, though. Oh, was I supposed to do that? Yeah. I don't know. If they're really paying attention, they should know about the course. <laughs> well, I don't, I mean, get on the wait list. I don't know. It's it's a good thing. It'll be in the show notes. Do you want to describe the course? Uh, I feel like I spent all morning describing the course. Like we spent a morning just working and it's good. Like, oh man, this is the day where like at the end of the day I will be like I worked out I made stuff I recorded a podcast but I don't know if I laughed or not um but yeah I don't know I'm tired there's so many things I I wish that um yeah like MailChimp and and yeah that's that's where it's gotten to be like the creating and and refining the course and getting everything perfect that's kind of fun but the stuff we're doing now which is like Landing pages and Yes, good MailChimp clarification. The like, course, that was the easy part of like only like really uh, figuring out the last five years in my heart. Like what is the impact I plan on having? That's the easy part um, when it finally came to the surface. But, but, but MailChimp is hard. Well, and what else are, it's not just MailChimp. It's, and it's Square form and, and it's Jotform. And form they don't and all play together. Yeah, and it's the web page and all that stuff. It's like... I, you know who we need to sponsor the show? Kajabi. Yeah, one of those would be great. I mean, hey, they're, Kajabi. They're kind of like a sked for courses of like, mm-hmm. that's what I wish we had is like that thing of like, auto send this. If this happens, then send that. Yes. If someone signs up, have it automatically schedule a reminder to we do this. We used to do all of that completely manual at our clinic. That's insane. Yeah. I mean, I see why they, you know, say it's like having an extra CA or mm-hmm. whatever of like it. If, honestly, if there was a software program that could do that for us with the course, like now I'm starting to see why people pay so much for the Kajabis, the, yeah. you know, click funnel, all that stuff. So, yeah, I think if I told our CAs <coughs> that we were going back on, on sked to like them just doing it, I, yeah, it, it wouldn't, it's working better than them doing it. So, so I'm glad it's worth it. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're interested in something like that, We'll put something in the show notes. Well, and I mean, honestly, it's changed our, like, part of the course is talking about lowering your overhead in any ways that you can potentially automate. Mm-hmm. And so, like, it's not like the course. The course is not sponsored by Skit. No. <laughs> so I mean, it's if they not want gonna, to, we could talk about it. I mean, t- call me. Um, no, but it is going to be, part of it is going to be talking about simplifying systems and, you know, that's one of them. So, mm-hmm. Okay, I you officially have me nervous about what you have in your notebook over there and what we're going to talk about. I am happy, though, anytime that I get to show up to a podcast, I literally have nothing except my LaCroix. I don't really have it structured. I just have a bunch of oh, different topics that we could talk about. But we'll find it. <laughs> I trust. Awesome. Cool, cool. Love it. Okay, well, then let's pray. All let's right. do it. Sounds good. All right, let's take a deep breath and really focus on it. Thank you, God, for this moment and for this opportunity to talk. Thank you for my wife and the life that we have. Thank you for the journey that we're all on and finding you in different ways and stumbling and getting back up and having moments of absolute bliss and moments where we're completely lost in our thoughts. A lot of times you can't identify what you need until you find out what you don't need. So help us on this journey to... Keep finding our way back to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Notebook, man. Oh, well, actually, before we do that, the whole... So, okay. This kind of came from a 
uh, JAMA. What does that stand for? Jer- Journal of Journal American, of American Med- Med- Medical the, Association? Journal of the American Medical Association. Yeah. Well, it's JAMA Psychiatry. Okay. So anyways, they released a random clinical trial November 9th of this month mm-hmm. saying that mindfulness-based stress reduction... Uh, or they did a study of that versus escitalopram, which I think is Lexapro. And the results were that mindfulness-based stress reduction exercises is not inferior to Lexapro, which, I mean, it's an interesting way to... It, you know what it reminds me of? And what? I think I've talked about this on the podcast before. They did a study because, like, coconut water was kind of blown up and everyone was drinking coconut water. And then there was a study and a news story that came out that said, coconut water is no better at Gatorade than hydrating you. And I was like, I think you got that wrong of you don't need to put a bunch of dyes and chemicals in you. You could just drink chem- coconut water right? and it's just as good. That's amazing. Nature's great. Right. Well, okay. So I guess I'm not surprised that the that JAMA wouldn't go like, yeah, it's better or as good. It's like, who's not inferior? guess if we have to say that so that's where it came from which honestly that in itself I have mixed so I feel like let's see how do I like I feel that that is so I shared it okay Mm -hmm. this is this is where I'll go with this so I shared it on my stories and I have friends who are on anxiety medication Mm -hmm. like very close to me friends like um like they're right behind you (laughs) and i felt like an asshole for sharing it because i know that i don't know like i know they're tired i think that's they're doing the best they can yeah i think that's interesting of all you did was share information now in an ideal world everything would have the caveat and we should say it on this too of like no judgment against people who do medication. Like a lot of the things we're talking about are useful and can be as effective as if you're able to force yourself to do it. Yeah. So like, that's the other study is I think it's like three to five days of cardio, vigorous cardio, 30 to 45 minutes is as effective or more effective than Prozac. But if you are deeply depressed, Mm -hmm. you probably don't, don't have the willpower or inclination to start doing that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or if your life situation or whatever makes it so that these practices, it's so hard because all of these are practices. They aren't one-time things. Mm -hmm. And even though the drugs have their own caveats too of side effects and dosage and getting on the right one that can take months and months and years, it's at least you're hopeful with a thing that you can do and you know you can manage swallowing that pill. Like, yeah. so it's worth, I'm glad people are trying things and no judgment against people who do medication. Like, well, and honestly, I mean, I haven't shared publicly at all, especially since not freaking working, but I have a feeling that a part of my guilt about share or like my thoughts around like, yeah, nice if mindfulness actually works for you if you get it is like you know starting like i started doing the peptides Mm -hmm. for weight loss stuff and there's this feeling where it's like i have done diet and exercise since i was out of high school i mean in high school you know i was on dance team and Mm -hmm. was working out you know (laughs) um but i have done diet and exercise and diet and exercise and diet and exercise and still unhappy and so it's hard because i feel like mentally you go like well you could lose weight if you just did the right diet and exercise and Mm. i am 36 and i have been trying to get to a good place using diet and exercise Mm -hmm. i mean i've done the you're working out too much oh you need to be doing weight lifting oh you need to be like you protein keto this that like and it's just like you know what i'm just tired and i give in i want to try i want to try the peptides and you have to do them with diet and exercise and Mm -hmm. working yeah all the studies say like uh, 
only 25 percent of the people who lose weight on peptides actually keep it off and the ones that do are the ones that also what? change their diet and exercise while they were on them but what if the diet and exercise you didn't need to drop that bomb on me well anyways all right so hey, i think that you mean you didn't do research before putting a medication <laughs> into your body uh well my research was there were multiple chiropractors i knew who were doing it and so i was like well i'm assuming they did their research you. i know so i knew you would it was funny me trying to tell Kirby, like, because I knew he wasn't going to be happy about it because Kirby just likes no nothing. Like, I haven't gotten Botox yet, but he's not happy about the idea that I would do that. I talked about jaw filler the other day. Not happy about that. He's not happy about my extensions. Anything. But anyway, so I got so nervous and awkward. The first thing out of my mouth was like, well, they're FDA approved. And it was just like, oh my God, worst thing I could have said Wrong to him. person to say oh, that to. Oh God, like just I almost... Just a Vioxx and walked away. Uh, so, so anyways, I think that's why I definitely just have a soft spot for like, yeah, mindfulness, but also not shaming anyone who it's like, listen, I, I did that and I'm not healthy and I, I, need, I need to do the medication thing. But... Today, we are talking about mindfulness. And gratitude. And gratitude. Which I would say gratitude is a part of mindfulness. Or are they the same thing? No. Because gratitude is focusing on, it's not only focusing on the moment, but it can also be focusing on the past or the future and feeling a sense of thankfulness and joy. Um, whereas mindfulness may or may not be something you're grateful for. I mean, I think mm. eventually if you mm -hmm. really do sink into the moment or have a good practice, you will be grateful for it. But some of the practices of mindfulness are not necessarily gratitude-based. Um, I think that gratitude exercises has gotten a lot more like, what's your morning routine type mm. of thing? Uh, I think it probably comes from like Rachel Hollis, like had a whole like, I write 10 things, I don't know. And I've always struggled with gratitude exercises and I realized in the last year and a half that it's because I'm never mindful. Mm -hmm. So like I can say like, it's like, okay, what am I grateful for? Like I'm grateful for this and I'm grateful for that. I guess like I can write down things, but I don't feel the gratitude. Like mm. I don't feel that feeling of I am grateful for that coffee this morning. It's like, oh, I'm grateful I had coffee. I'm grateful I had a good workout. Sure, 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 sure. But because I'm never mindful in that experience mm -hmm. while I'm experiencing it, while I'm drinking the coffee, it's hard later to say, yes, I felt gratitude for that coffee because I didn't feel anything. I just drank it. You're thinking about it. You're not feeling it. And that's a big part of mindfulness is kind of see, see, like soaking in the present feelings and what's happening within you. And so when we talked, when you talked about like, I have trouble remembering sometimes like when I laughed or mm -hmm. what I should be grateful for, a big part of that, and I think we've talked about this a little on the podcast before, is just how your brain is wired. So like negative events are like Velcro and positive events to your mind are like Teflon. Like they just don't hold on to them unless you attach some other thing. So like if last night when we got into a lettuce fight oh with Charlie. God. I bitch slapped my 10 year old with a piece of romaine. <laughs> and then we started throwing lettuce all around the kitchen and everyone was laughing. If in that moment or even right after it happened, you tied it to like your senses. So like you've heard us do like the five, four, three, two, one thing of like really look around like see the smiling faces, feel how you feel in that moment. Is there a certain smell in the air? Like what's the sounds, like remembering the sounds of laughter and you savor those things for 15 or more seconds. I think they usually say 30 is better. You create not only a word memory or like quick visual memory, but you create a whole sense memory. And that's one, can help you remember that for longer. And two, when you do remember it, we'll tap back into that feeling. So that's what uh, Stu Bittman's 12 Weeks to mm -hmm. Your Heart thing is when you start, it's tricky and it's amazing to, to go through that. And I would recommend people do it because when you start, it's like, uh, it's like with meditation or with like breathing exercises too. If I said like, feel your heart right now, 
Like feel it beating. And some people can, and some people it takes a long time to be able to concentrate and feel. I have a resting heart rate of 96, and I also drink a ton of caffeine. So like You're just always feeling your heart. Yeah, I'm always like, oh yeah, right there, got it. So then there's the physical heartbeat, but then there's also like, think of a moment that warmed your heart. And go back there and sit in that and, and you know close your eyes and think about it until your heart starts to actually warm and expand. Mm-hmm. Like melty. I was yeah. going to say, like it gets melty. Yeah. Like some people that takes a really long time to do. And the more, so does you, that mean I'm really good at it since I was able to do it so quick just while you were talking? You're the, you're the best. Here's a ribbon. I have one in my pocket. <laughs> so that's difficult for Did some you people. Your own ribbons. Yeah, ribbons, or at least buttons, stars. trophies. Thank you. Be fantastic. Anyway, keep going. I'm going to have to get some big cargo pants. Keep going. So that's, it's a thing that you have to practice. And like, that's kind of the hard thing too. It kind of gets back to like the, the pill versus practice thing of like, it's not, and I think that's why so many people have a little bit of mindfulness, but then they go, oh, that didn't work for me. Meditation doesn't work for me. I tried sitting down quietly for 15 minutes one time. And that whole subject is now a thing I go, yep, did it. Mm. I like, mean, chiropractors can relate to that. Like, yeah, absolutely. Like patients being like, why well, I did. And you're like, oh, how often did you go? And they're like, I went like once a week for like a month. And I'm like, oh, well, check chiropractic off. Sure. Yeah, tried that. Okay, next. Hey, She Slayers. So many of you connect with my story as a chiropractor because I started all wrong. Years into practice, I had to completely turn it around from being an insurance and pain-based model to a thriving subluxation-based cash practice. I have a lot of ways that that happened, but I am not exaggerating when I say the number one thing I changed was adding CLA's insight scanning technology. The insight helped grow our practice from 300 people a week to over 500 a week in the course of one year, purely by showing objective findings and providing reports to patients. So many docs I talk to struggle to communicate the why behind a care plan when the patient's pain goes away in a few visits. They struggle to keep patients after insurance stops paying. They don't know how to explain why a kid benefits from chiropractic care, even though they have no symptoms. They don't do progress exams because what am I going to do to show the patient progress? I am telling you every single thing I just said, my answer to the doc is, are you using insight scanning technology in your clinic yet? Because it's the solution to all of those issues. If you have questions, the staff at CLA is absolutely incredible and will help answer those questions and help implement this big change into your practice Click the link below in the show notes as She Slays listeners get preferred pricing and hundreds of dollars off their purchase. Hey, She Slayers. When I first started practice, I thought I needed to dress a certain way for patients to trust me, and I spent hours trying to design communication and marketing materials that worked. After 12 years of practice, here's a couple things I've learned. One, I don't have to wear dress pants and button-ups for a patient to take me seriously. And two, Why recreate the wheel when a design professional has already done all the work for me? Well Aligned offers solutions in both of these categories. They have the coolest and most comfy chiropractic shirts that will showcase your personality, as well as beautifully designed communication and marketing tools to help drive new patients, get more referrals, and gain better retention in your practice. From the best chiropractic apparel to modern patient education materials, Well Aligned has you covered. All She Slayers get 10% off plus free shipping on orders of $75 or more with promo code She Slays. Visit www.wellaligned.com to save. So maybe a good place to start is let's go through what, it doesn't even have to be a routine, but like what's your mindfulness or gratitude routine or practices that you employ? What do you like? What do you not like? You're asking me? Yeah. I don't do anything. Sure you do. I do? We say what we're grateful for with our girls every night. I know, but it's really hard. That's the gratitude exercise. That's not the mindfulness. I said mindfulness or gratitude. I know, but it's hard for me in those moments to think of something because I haven't been mindful all day. 
And I'm just like, oh, damn it. That's right. Every night I have to say something. What about, so you listen to Christian music incredibly loud. I do. That's something. Yeah. That's, I, I, is that mindfulness though? Like that's like, like it has to be that loud because then it like the music like overpowers my like thoughts and energy. Yeah. So, so one of the things, would you say, I, I, how I view a lot of mindfulness stuff is being in tune with myself and my relation to whatever's greater, like the thing mm. that all things come from. Okay. So then probably just Christian music. That's probably just it. That's, that's just it for it. Okay. That's all I got. And would you say when you're, when you're listening to it, does it truly feel loud or do you like get quiet inside with the feeling that you're feeling? I don't know. I want you to think about that the next time you're like in it and like having all the feels. I'd be very curious. Well, see, yesterday you told me before work, because we knew we were going to do this, you wanted me to try that one breath thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, here. Okay. So tell people what you told me to do, and then I'll tell you what my results were. Okay. So I had heard about this mindfulness practice of just throughout the day before you do the next thing. Or like, but right before you walk into a meeting, before you go to the next patient, before you get in the car and, you know, bring your kids to school, you take one moment and go, I'm going to take one breath. And you fully experience that breath. You feel it all the way in. You feel it all the way out. Connect with your body. On to the next thing. Three to five seconds. Okay. So I'm going to be honest. I only did it like three times because I didn't like what it did to my flow of adjusting. Okay. So, uh, and this is going to be a weird thing to put into words. Like chiropractors will understand. Like, um, so I didn't expect, I expected for it to like deepen my connection with the adjustment and working with energy and the person's innate. Mm -hmm. Um, it brought me out of their, like being open to their energy and brought me very Focused much inside my own body. Mm -hmm which set me backwards of like, then it was like, I'm touching a wall. Like I, you know, so like when I'm in flow, yep. like the hands are just like receiving magnets and I can just put them on someone and it's like, right hip. And when I took the breath before I placed my hands on people, I, I didn't have that. My energy wasn't out in my hands. It was like inside my own body. That is really interesting. And I, know. I, I like, I, I honestly, as you're saying it, I didn't even think of that before. For you, if the practice was anything, it might be before you step into the building, you know, find mm -hmm. your energy, change your energy, because that is from what I've been reading um, about flow, that is true of it's a state of non-thought. So if you're going, I need to take a thought and change my focus to me and so not just be like, mm -hmm. because a lot of flow too is that time like compresses or exp like you lose track of time mm -hmm. when you're engaged in flow. And if you're going, okay, take five seconds, you're now reintroducing your awareness of time and changing your focus of your energy. Yeah. That's interesting. So yeah. So don't, so it might so not don't work do it with between, flow. Don't do it between or interrupt your flow. That's oh. really cool. Mm -hmm. So I'll have to find some other time to try that. I like it. I like breathing, but okay. So anyways, <laughs> One thing that I'd be interested in, and I know you've never done this, is introducing silence in some form. Um, I mean, what do you I have silence? Mindful silence. Like this is meditation, isn't it? It can be a walking meditation. It can be just but I do think it is some form of meditation where you are going, I see that thought. I'm not that thought. Let that thought float away. But it's not. So like you say, you like overwhelm yourself with Christian music and you can connect with something there. But there's also the space for something to come up and the space for you to let things go. And if there's outside noise and distraction, that can be a whole different thing. Like that's like you said, it's almost like pushing everything else out. So you're really focused in that moment. But are you present in that moment? Yes. 
You are present in that moment? Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe the thing to say more is it's pushing things away and filling everything, but eventually it's going to go away and what comes back. Oh, just rapid, rapid thoughts. But like, but this is the hard part of like, this, everybody's in that loop. Like, so doing a mindfulness exercise, if that's not, if you can't just do it for five minutes and then like, oh, but then it comes, what comes back is real life. Real life comes back. But isn't that the point of the exercise is that like you're breaking that up? So you're breaking it up and you're learning to be in touch with, as you, as you practice more, you start to realize what your brain is doing and what you can step back from and what is you and what is an emotion that you do or don't have to attach to. So a big thing for me that's been helpful is my therapist has me doing a mood tracker. So I would totally recommend it. I think it's called iMood Tracker. It might be like two bucks or something like that. Um, what it does is it just reminds you throughout the day to check in. So it just says, how are you feeling right now? And it's got a scale from one to 10. And then you can write Isn't a- 10, what is 10? Insanely great. I insanely think. great. Have you rated a 10 at all? I think there was one and it was like, I was taking a, you know, like me day. I had golfed. Then I saw my dad and brother and were, was golfing with them and it was the perfect day and it was awesome. And so I was insanely great. And then like 20 minutes later, I got a terrible phone call, which is funny. <laughs> but in that moment, I was. Oh, yeah. and, and honestly, that's part of why it's really helpful is so when you are tracking your mood a few times a day, one, it's, it's a good check-in because like the reason I really got down a spiral with anxiety and, and I wouldn't call it clinical depression or anything, but like down moods was I think I let, I let a thought pattern or I let a mood just keep riding and keep spiraling and keep circling. So if I would have been doing a better job of a little buzzer goes off at 10 a.m. and says, how are you feeling? And if I went meh and then I wrote out the thing that I'm thinking of, you know, like I'm behind on my work, I've got to get this podcast edited or whatever. And then Jacob's like, fuck you, I do that now. <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. <laughs> uh, so then what my therapist said is, okay, write, write down like what's going on. And this is another practice that's semi tied together of like write down your limiting thought or like what's upsetting you. Then take even just five minutes, go for a walk. If that's what you like, you know, go pet your dog, do some push ups. meditate for five minutes, just do something to get out of that space and then come back. And if you can reframe it and go like, you're not, you know, like you have this thing to do and you have enough time to do it. You're going to get it done. And then you move on to the next thing instead of like stacking all the things up. So it gives you that opportunity to tap into yourself, actually feel what you're feeling, reflect on it, replace it with something else, and then move on with your day with a new set. Like you get to reset a little bit and then go, okay, so I was meh at 10 a.m., but by the time I, you know, came back and did that, and then I got the podcast done, and then when you check in with me at noon, I go, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. Mm-hmm. I had a thought. Okay. Don't make fun of me. It's a little bit... Okay. So in the new Santa Claus, mm -hmm. they talk... They're t I'm very interested where they're going or if they're going to dive more into this whole um, people being disconnected thing. Oh, yeah. Like, I don't want to do any spoilers, but like they were very much talking about how like pe they, they're losing the magic because like people are weird and disconnected and I was just like it is such a interesting thing where it's like as a society mm -hmm. we have no way of knowing we have no way of knowing if we're more just messed up like I and mean, like we, chiropractors we do are, we do like we can look at the onset of the first depressive episode of people and in the last 40 years, so like of people who experience depression, the average onset of first depressive episode, I have the book upstairs, but I believe it went from like 28 to 14 and a half in 40 years. So 
what has changed in the last 40 years? It's not evolution. That's too fast. We have not evolved to be a more depressive species, but we have introduced a lot more screen type stuff mm -hmm. and have gone from things were in the physical real world to things real were in food. the... Yeah. So it, like I would say... A lot you know, more physical activity mm -hmm. or in the past. And it ties into flow. So I believe it was researched by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who's like the godfather of flow psychology research. Of They studied, I think it was like two cohorts of 250 kids, and they studied the types of activities they did. And so one was kind of like the hang at the mall, then watch people, play video games, watch TV, chill. And the other group was more prone to play sports, play music, spend more time on homework and reading. Now, the funny thing is, is both the chill kids and the engaged kids assumed the chill kids were having more fun. But when they actually measured like different units of happiness and satisfaction, the kids who were engaged, who had more flow in their life because they were in those harder activities, reported more happiness momentarily and had greater lifetime outcomes of monetary and happiness success. Hmm. Okay. I mean, I think I... So working my ass off is good. I'd be mm. worse off if I wasn't. Your flow while you're adjusting is good. Yeah, it is. I love that. I love that feeling. That's the hard part of like thinking like, I don't know that I could ever not adjust. That's the only reason is like, oh, because I would miss that. But, mm -hmm. Um, okay. So story time. Okay. This one time I was high and I was watching. Like you were on a tall ladder? Yes. That's yes. I was standing on a tall ladder and I was very high. Smoking a joy. <laughs> no, it was an edible. And I was washing the dishes. Mm -hmm. And while I was washing the dishes, I was very like just the water and the temperature and like the texture and high off my ass and just like washing the dishes and what like just feeling how the sponge was removing things and it in that moment I understood like mindfulness mm -hmm. of like wow I realized in that moment I had the thought of like you are never this present in anything you do like isn't like, that a beautiful moment? It was. It really was. Like, and, but also sad because then it's like, and then, you know, and then I was like, not high. So, but it, yeah, in that moment, it was like, wow, this is what being present in life can be. Mm -hmm. And just like, really, and that's tough. I don't know how to, so like, what would your advice, and you don't get to say, get high, get high all the day. time. No, no I, I think, I think things like marijuana, things like psychedelics are, you know, like some people go like, there's no, there's no shortcuts to heaven of like, you should work to it. You should get to it. That's just playing with it or dabbling with it or whatever. I think those experiences have power in exposing you to what's possible. Mm -hmm. So like even Ram Dass, who did a ton of LSD type stuff in the 60s and 70s and then became a full guru, said like he, he can now get that. Well, he's passed away now, so he's always there. But when he was alive, he said like, I can still get back to that. And the LSD was a shortcut and it showed me what was possible. But I would not recommend that you just have to constantly be on it and you don't actually have any spiritual growth. Like the mm. point is to it's live your of, life and get your mind to a place. So it's kind of the, um, I was watching a video on TikTok the other day and it was a chiropractor. Um, who was it? Cause I want to give him credit. Um, Brett Jones. Yes. Okay. And he was saying like one of the biggest things that he says to his patients are like, can you, visualize yourself being better mm -hmm. like can you see that as a possibility for your life i don't remember anything else he said but like basically because then my brain started going like oh la, 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 and i stopped listening but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I love your voice in your head but it was that like 
you see it's possible. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, that is, that's in everywhere. That's like why they recommend joining a higher level mastermind. You mm -hmm. see it be done. It's the four minute mile. Yeah. It, and so it is that like, I can see, not that I'm recommending everybody like goes out and does mushrooms or anything, but like, I can see what you're saying or what Ramadas was saying of like, once you feel like, oh, that, that's in me. Like mm -hmm. that was in me. Yep. Like there was no part of that experience that was like, oh, without that, I could never feel that. It was like, no, you're just deeply present. Yeah. So you could, in theory, do that right now. And it's like, oh. And that's, that's the cool thing. And that's why I wanted to talk about like mindfulness and silence and stuff too, is so there's, there's two kinds of knowing I'm listening to a book called golden. Um, and it's about silence and what impact it can have. And they talk about cataphatic versus apophatic knowing. So cataphatic is like the thinking knowing, like the words, like you understand the concept. So like you could theoretically know that like, oh, if I, you know, sat still or if I meditated or if I like did that, then I would feel bliss when I was washing the dishes. Like, and you go, sure. But you don't feel, it's remembering the thing, but not mm -hmm. feeling the thing. And the apophatic is the ineffable, undeniable, you know it, and you know those things, like you knew that moment. You knew when God's presence has been in your life. You know, and there, by their definition, you can't get the words to fully describe them. Mm -hmm. You can't put that feeling into someone else. And so that's the thing of like, so you had that experience, you were high, you felt amazing, but you knew that you'd touch some truth somewhere. Yeah. So that's you the idea. Truths, right? What's that? The, the, I love that phrase. Those, your soul like recognizes truth. Yes. So like that's the feeling and that's kind of like the, it's the goal, I guess, or it's the treat, but there's so much goodness along the way in mindfulness of like, if people just think of it as I meditate for 10 minutes in the morning and then I'm done and I felt great for that 10 minutes and then it's kind of all downhill from there. Ideally, and the thing that I found, I don't know, maybe there are people who meditate for 20 minutes in the morning and they're great. But what I found is when I incorporate, you know, a reminder or just catching myself of like, what are you so mad about right now? Or how do you want to feel? Or like, what are you, what are you seeing? What are you touching? What are you smelling right now? Like bringing you back into the present moment are those things that you get the opportunity. If you're going to be washing the dishes anyway, why not be high? Why not? be high? <laughs> No, why not look and see if like, if you're actually there, if you can go like, what, let me just do a rundown through my senses right now. Like what temperature what does the water feel like? Mm -hmm. Not just, is it hot or cold? Like, what does it feel like? Is there a single sun ray that's coming through the window that glints off that bowl? And I've never noticed that chip in that thing. That's interesting. And just being there with it, you can find so much happiness in the mundane things of life. And I think the thing that people worry about, and you tell me if this is what you worry about, is if I was happier in my momentary life, then I wouldn't have the drive to go accomplish big things because it's my discomfort with the current moment that runs the constant engine. No, I would disagree. No? Okay. So what is your resistance to? ADHD. <laughs> well, there's a pill for that. Oh, God. You know what else works for ADHD? Mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think that I'm multi -tip. I'm air quotes to everyone. You can't see. Mm -hmm. I'm multitasking. I am washing the dishes and solving problems. I'm washing the dishes and thinking of a reel that I could put to that audio. I'm washing the dishes and thinking about like my to-do list. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm not doing that, then when does all that thinking have to happen? Does it have to happen? I don't know. Like... Will everything fall apart if I stop thinking? Probably not. I mean, so think of it this way. If, if people say like, okay, well, I have to be, I have to be the boss. I have to get things done in my meetings. I have to talk. Like it all goes through me. Like I'm an important person. Gandhi, pretty important person. Lots of stuff going on. 
running political stuff, you know, raging against the government, solving famine and war issues, didn't talk every Monday for years. Oh, that sounds kind of nice. He just had a my Sunday or Monday was silent. Still went to some meetings, but people knew like he wasn't going to talk. Oh, I'm going to do that. It'd be interesting, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'm going to do it on Monday where I'm adjusting like 100 people. <laughs> like, sorry, Monday is my quiet day. You just wear a little sign around your neck. Hmm. But I'm saying it's like the thing. And one, Gandhi has the great quote, too, of like, I have a lot of difficult things to do today. I better meditate twice as long. Like, it's not about the constant doing. It's from what wisdom place are you doing those things from? And do you have the presence and distance from the thing to understand what's truly important and what's not? Because we've all been super, super busy. And in a moment, something changes or a different priority changes. And those things that were so busy and so important don't get done for weeks because someone died or you had a catastrophe at work, so you reprioritized other things. And those things that absolutely needed to get done never got done or got moved two or three weeks. Like, if you had the presence of mind, you might see those things for what they are and understand why you're doing things that could save you a lot of time or what you're wasting emotion on or... Or just being present to say like, oh, that was a good afternoon. Instead of going like, I got a lot done. I think I was tense the whole time because while I was doing it, I was thinking of the other things I need to do. And you don't savor the amazing thing you did that afternoon. Okay. So let's take this out of the ethereal philosophy room and wrap this up with three. You get three. Three recommendations to someone who is looking to start mindfulness okay I'm trying to think of like what i've seen that's statistically like this will really help um one mood tracker okay that's asking you at least three times a day i would say up to five it's great because it makes you check in with yourself gives you a chance to course correct and it gives you a chance to look back at empirical data because if you are a catastrophic thinker or a depressive thinker you might go like this whole week has sucked and you can go back and you go like oh actually tuesday was like sevens and eights like that was a good day mm -hmm. kind of leads you into your own gratitude thing of like you get to re-experience like why was tuesday so great so that'd be one is a mood tracker Two, some daily meditation. So if you cannot sit still, walking meditation. The big focus is to try to sit back into your witness. And as you think a thought, don't get mad of like, oh, I'm thinking, I'm not focused on my breath. The breath is an easy thing to focus on because it centers you in your body. And kind of if you're going like in, out, it takes away the ability to think a thought, but thoughts are going to creep in and go, okay, don't engage it. Just let it float by, go back to your breath. Doing that, start it five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, transcendental meditation, 20 minutes, two times a day. You'll get there eventually. It's like you wouldn't tell someone to like go lift heavy for an hour right. and a half when they're first starting out. And there's trainers. Muse is a good one. What's the other big one? Calm. Mm -hmm. Like just try it out and not in like the way that crappy people try out chiropractic. Like go, Don't. I'm going to do this. Be your best patient. Yeah. I'm going to do this and you can set different goals three times a week, five times a week, but I'm going to do this for the next four to six weeks. And if you're tracking your moods, then you have your data, you know? Because you might go like, eh, I don't know how much it's helping. Check your mood tracker. Mm, See if okay. it's helping. Okay. Um, hmm, what's the third one? Not can I think of anything, but what would I suggest? What's helped? I would say try to find 
at least five minutes a day where you can have appreciative silence. Oh, this is different than the meditation? It's different than meditation. Oh, for fuck's sake. Like, what? if you can, and, and it doesn't have to actually be truly, truly silent. So that's a thing that just something where nothing is commanding your attention. So like, put your phone away. Um, don't be in a room like, don't, because like, you can meditate in a room with your kids. Yeah. And it's like, oh, there's a noise. Ignore the noise or whatever. Like truly just try to sit with yourself. And ideally, if you want to meditate in that, you can. But if you just want to be there in the nothing, um, nature is good too. Like I don't really count bird noise as, or like trees rustling. Like there's something about that that is still so quiet. So if you can find a place that is actually silent or a place that is free from artificial noise. And it, do it counter to, like, I wouldn't line up my things of, like, I'm going to meditate for 10 minutes and then go be in silence and just be. Break them up. Yeah. yeah kind of that midday. Mm -hmm. Probably right before your coffee kicks in. Mm -hmm. Right before your midday coffee. <laughs> Can I be drinking my coffee while I'm doing it? So is there any writing down or is that to skip into gratitude stuff? Oh... Honestly, that one might be better than the silence one. Because, yeah, I mean, if you're doing the mood tracker, you're probably writing things down as you're going through that. Um, but when you talk about scientific difference, I think having a gratitude practice, writing down things at the end of the day does cement things in. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'm going to swap my third one out and say gratitude journaling. People got a bonus. Bonus. You get four. You got homework to do. Okay. The other thing I've been liking lately is um, saying thank you as the first thought of the day. Like mm -hmm. as I'm getting out of bed. So it's more like when I'm getting out of bed because what I'll notice is I'll be like, uh, Ty came into bed last night. Maggie barked at 1130 and I had to take her out. Like I wake up kind of grumpy. But if I remember, as my feet are hitting the ground, I go, thank you. Oh, I like that. And that is like course correct in my mood several mornings in the past two weeks. Huh. So there's all an right. extra bonus I one. I like that. I just need to figure out a way to remind myself because I'm like, i always like, yeah, I'm going to do that. And then I'm like, you ask me like, so have you done it? I'm like, no, I totally forgot, but I accomplished a lot of other stuff. So, well, thank you. I uh, Sorry, I got rambly. I could talk about this stuff all day. Philosophy in general is rambly. Like, it's mm -hmm. just, it's why I... I remember quitting, walking out of my first philosophy class in, in college because I was just so used to like Annette and Fizz and biochem and this and that. And then I like walked in and did philosophy 101. And I was like, what the hell are you guys talking about? Nerds. You're not accomplishing anything. So no, I appreciate it. So, well, okay. Um, make sure to message me if you think that it, we should have watched Santa Claus one, two, or three first. That should be your biggest takeaway. After yeah, all, at the, the last hour, that should be the number one thing you remember to um, do. I'll link to the books that I've been reading recently. Yeah. Golden and Authentic Happiness and The Happiness Hypothesis are three books that I would absolutely recommend. Link the study. Yep, link the study. Link to my Christmas list. Just kidding. I don't have one. You got to make one. I know. I don't know what to buy you yet. Um, and the course. Yep, the course will have and a link. Patreon. Mm -hmm. And Sked, there'll be so many freaking show note links this time. Jacob's going to be busy. Oh, Jacob. We're, gr we're grateful for Jacob. Yeah, very All grateful. right. Well, we hope you had an awesome Thanksgiving. And um, truly, thank you for, we are grateful for you. And, Absolutely. And all that you do to keep listening and sharing. That, that helps. So we love you. And until next week, bye. Bye. Bye.